Pokemon! Again. Listen, explaining Pokemon the first time was insulting. Explaining Pokemon a second time would be a death threat. We're back again to talk turkey on Poke Pets, except we're gonna head over from Kanto to Johto this time to discuss all manner of potential partners. Who knows, given the abundance of evolutions in this region, some mons that bottomed out near the tail end of the last list might get a second shot. But this region is also the same one that introduced evil type. Oh, they try to doll it up in English with dark type, but what are the chances that a creature that was born evil is gonna pee on the news? paper. As a reminder, these pets are being graded based on how easy it is to house them, if they have a good typing for pet ownership, determined by this graph, if they're a well-behaved Pokemon, if they're safe to be around, and finally if it's an easy animal to take care of. With Steel-type being introduced alongside Dark, you might need to start penciling in some polish to keep that coat nice and shiny. After tallying up the scores, we'll go over the five overachievers, who are everything you could ever want in a pet, as well as the underachievers, who, at best, didn't pass in work, and at worst are gonna show you if your intestines match the curtains. Starting out the list is Mr. Lonely, the sole representative of his grade and avoided being a worst pet contender by a mere 0.5 points. Remember how I said some Pokemon would get a second chance to impress? It's also a second chance to get worse. Onyx wasn't a high-ranking Pokemon before, coming in with a five of his own, but Steelix manages to dig his way even deeper onto the list. In fact, that's exactly how we got into this mess in the first place. Steelixes are born when an onyx burrows deep underground, some deeper than half a mile. This can also take up to a hundred years to fully play out, so if you're in the market for a present for your great-grandson's 21st birthday, teach onyx dig! When it finally does show back up, he's not any easier to take care of than onyx was, still shoveling delicious dirt into its mouth for nutrients, which means that, like it or not, you're now the town moat maker. His jaw is strong enough to crack through boulders. If you think your unweatherized shed is safe, think again. Imagine going to adopt a cat and coming back with a cat bulldozer. You dug your grave, now dig it deeper! Five is another lonely number, as its sole representative is one of Johto's legendary beasts. Entei is a bundle of complicated feelings all trapped inside one big grumpy cat. A common trait among all three beasts is an inability to sit still. These three were the first roaming legendaries in Pokemon, and nothing short of contracting out a Doug Trio is gonna keep them from running. Not rain, nor sleep, nor snow is gonna stop these guys from getting where they wanna go, which is far away from you and your dollar store treats. Then, once you get your hands on the thing, it only gets more complicated. When this Pokemon barks, somewhere in the world, a volcano erupts. Not often a Fire-type deals psychic damage, but knowing that when Entei sees the mail truck, whole civilizations are gonna be turned to ash, it's pretty haunting. Of the three beasts, it's also the most ornery, while Suicune is off purifying lakes and you know, not being a nice type for some reason, and Raikou is off chasing its tail, and Tay is kidnapping women. I know it's an illusion of him, but... The real Entei didn't seem too eager to clear up the confusion. I just think that's interesting. I'm just saying, we tally up the numbers, Entei definitely wins the kidnapping women competition. Six is when the categories finally start getting some meat on them, as we've got four Pokemon to tackle. Up first is Foratress. Not since Electrode has a Pokemon seemingly had so little going for it. On the outside, it's a big metal ball with a few pegs on the side, but on the inside... Well, that's not really known, but it only takes one dex entry to turn this from a boulder buddy into one of the most hazardous Pokemon you could ever get. Is it deadly? Is it traumatizing? Does it come from Alola? I see a Y in my future! In the Devil's Playground of Alola, they've discovered that Fortress handling is actually just a really clever way to cash in on life insurance, since approaching it causes it to fire off sharp metal fragments. Wanna know what else fires off sharp metal fragments? Guns! And in case the more daring among us think they'll just build up its trust via email before daring to get close to it, this is not something that Fortress can control. No matter what, as long as you approach him, he'll fire off shrapnel. It's not a conscious action, it's a reflex. Yeah, my pet's the shotgun door trap from Saw. What breed is yours? Sneasel is next, and as our first dark type, he 
fails at leaving much of a positive impression. Dark and Ice is already a miserable type combination for pet ownership. The money that you save on lighting your house immediately goes into cooling it 24-7. It loves to hunt for itself, but the only thing this little stinker feels comfortable going one-on-one -on -one with are unattended eggs. I mean, if I were four times weak to fighting, I'd also probably try to avoid head-on fights as much as I could, but that doesn't mean you have to like me. Worse yet, this is a smart Pokémon. The Dex is constantly bragging about its intelligence, which means just like Gengar before it, it's smart enough to know that it's being bad and just doesn't care. Following closely behind Entei is his little brother Raikou. So, there's a popular theory that when the Brass Tower burned down and Ho-Oh revived the three lost Pokémon into the Legendary Beasts, the Pokémon revived were a Flareon, Jolteon, and Vaporeon. Makes sense! The Kimono Girls in the Dance Theater show that Eevee is clearly important to the town, they follow the type theming, and also ride the line of dog or cat just like Eevee. I think what really solidifies this theory, though, is how just like Jolteon when it comes to being a pet, Raikou is remarkably unremarkable. If Middle Child Syndrome hit Jolteon hard, it backs up over Raikou a few times for good measure. His brothers get movies all to themselves, but for Raikou, I fished this TV special out of the trash. You want it? Sure, he's a heck of a lot more dangerous than Jolteon, but it's not exactly hard to say that you can just copy and paste everything about Jolteon, swap out the names, and get the exact same result. All that he really has going for him is that if this were prehistoric times and the Order of Divinity was decided by who could wear the most neckties, he'd be a lock. Squeaking in with technically a higher score is Gligar. Now, Poison and Flying was already a pretty poor typing combination with Golbat, and it's not gonna take much longer to see how bad it is again, so to burden another Pokémon with it, it- What? Ground? Oh, what do you think when you see a purple scorpion Pokémon? Ooh! Ooh! Dirt! He may not be toxic by type, but he's certainly toxic by nature. Being an independent hunter means he's gonna take care of most of the hard work for you, but it's how he goes about catching that prey that raises some problems. His hunting tactics involve latching onto the victim's face and injecting them with, oh, poison, you say? Now oh, what, you aren't injecting them with mud? Well, now forgive my presumptions, but doesn't that sound like what a poison type would do? Aside from that, the only other major noteworthy thing about Gligar is that it likes to make its home up on high cliff faces, which means that housing is only as easy as your chimney is tall. Seven is, again, home to one no-hoper in the form of Ariados. All right, guys. We're all gonna be real nice to Ariados and pretend we didn't see this coming from a mile away. There's not much that needs to be said that Ariados's bright red coloring doesn't already tell you. A giant poisonous bug as a pet is already a gamble when you can keep it in a terrarium, but when you have to start negotiating out land with it, the dynamic shifts. And this isn't a bee drill situation where once it finds a spot it just completely takes it over. No, Ariados does doesn't like having just one spot to itself. It refuses to make just one web and will scatter them all around to catch as much food as possible, even leaving a single strand to help it get back to a web quickly. And Ariados is a nocturnal hunter, so as you try to sleep, the sounds of a giant spider scuttling around your house will be your white noise. Isn't that pleasant? There isn't a lot violent about its deck entries. One even implies this thing can make friends, but all that needs to be taken with a grain of salt when dealing with a spider that weighs as much as a couple hams. Eight is home to the next three Pokémon, with the first one not being a credit to his type's already abysmal reputation. Murkrow's just a little f He's said to be the bearer of ill fortunes and dread to whoever sees it at night, but after it swipes the hat off my head for the 15th time, I start to wonder if it's the Baron of Darkness or just a brat. He's a small bird, which means he's pretty easy to house, but you're not gonna really want him inside when he spends all night moving your wallet and keys around to new hiding spots just to watch you waddle around in the morning to try to find them. Assuming it even lets you have them back. Just like me 
me out, they love shiny objects, and are likely to hide them in personal spots only they can get to. And trying to get them back will only give you the conversation starter of, why do you have those talon marks on your face? He'll probably steal his own food just for the thrill of it, but... Other than that, avoid Murkrow. After him is the soul dragon type of Johto. Kingdra has come to avenge his line's middling performance from last time. Always gotta one-up the younger brothers. Seedra was fine, so Kingdra's gotta be terrible. Creates massive whirlpools every time it moves. Notice how it didn't say in the water. Kingdra should be a majestic water dragon. It's the only one the region has to call its own, but delving into what Kingdra actually does, it becomes pretty easy to see that it's resting on that majesty. It won't stop talking about how much it sleeps. It's either making whirlpools or sleeping in a cave. Does that sound like it wants to play fetch? Add up the danger, inactivity, and strict living conditions, and it's not hard to see that when it comes to water dragon types, sure was the first one. Last up is Pyloswine, and it's the first one where how awful he is almost wraps back around to being charming. Having a face-to-face -face chat with this thing requires throwing yourself on the ground. He's slow, blind, and yet still three feet tall. Ever wonder what it's like to have a mound of dirt as your pet? Sandygast is in shambles. So what makes him so bad? Surely if he's so slow, he can't be up to much, right? Yeah, if you don't count head trauma as much. Thanks to being unable to see, Pyloswine is on constant high alert of everything that could be a threat, and will rush headlong into whatever might be a danger to it. This includes attackers, predators, table legs, chair legs, human legs, he covers the whole spectrum. And it doesn't matter if he's not the fastest, a hundred pound pig smashing into you is gonna hurt. Trim his eyebrows and maybe it can work, but as is, wait until Sinnoh. Bad for Pokemon, worse for tourism. Nine is next, and first up is a Pokemon whose name doubles as instructions. Unknown. Folks out there with a favorite letter of the alphabet or who just really f***ing hate K are gonna find a lot to love with this thing. But what is this thing? Unown has threatened for years to have some sort of hidden power or importance that it just never really delivered on. It floats around, making a low hum, one that gets louder if you own multiple. Teaching a parrot how to cuss is so last year. I made my pets spell a bad word. And getting a bunch of them together is about the only way you're gonna get any value out of them, since when they're alone, all they do is stick to the wall. Despite how much people value Unown, it's never really done much of note aside from making an Entei that kidnaps women. The flip side of a Pokemon that's not really trying at all is one that's giving 100% at all times, even when it really, really shouldn't, and Caesar is that. If you have any experience with Scyther, you're already gonna have a leg up on training this thing, since it is no different in how strong it is, it's just distributed that strength differently. It might not have changed stat-wise, but ever since it put on that metal coat, it's been a lot more intense. A pair of scissors might seem safer than scythes, but a scissor is kind of like two scythes on its own, so if Scyther is a danger to you, Scizor is like a danger to national security. It's an aggressive hot rod red roach with a need to win or die trying. Now, Megas aren't being counted in this discussion because how best to abuse your dog isn't something to look into when picking him out. So if I start banging this pot next to his head, that will upset him? But Mega Caesar does give us a look into how serious this thing is. With how it will fight so hard, its body begins to melt. Hitmontop comes next, and you've already got an unreliable little pup. You adopt him hoping to see him spin. Look how little time he spends spinning! You're not called Hitmon Stand. now get spinning or get lost. He comes with all the usual trappings of fighting types, like being overly intense and a bundle of energy and kicks, but what puts Hitmontop this low is a mixture of being a pain to take care of and a pain to get kicked by. This thing's kicks are killer! 
propeller, especially when it finally does start spinning, and ups that destructive force by ten times. But the hardest part of owning a Hitmontop is just getting one. In order to get your hands on a Hitmontop, you need a Tie Rogue whose attack stat is the same as his defense stat. Ah yes, the perfect middle ground between punching and kicking. Kicking. Who'd have thought that a fighter could be such a diva? Finally for nine, and it brings me no pleasure to rate him so lowly. It's Crowbat. My beloved bat is sadly not the best of pets. First off, this thing is ginormous. You would peg him at beach ball size, maybe, but no, he's moving sideways through every door he sees. He's a blood drinker too, like Golbat, so he's gonna require gallons upon gallons of blood every day. And if he's too far away from home, you're gonna need to pick him up, cause he traded out his legs for extra wings. His fat little body will be there, bursting with yummy plasma, hopefully having killed whatever he got it from so it doesn't come to try to take it back. None of that sounds good, so what makes him worthy of the nine he earned? Well, Crobat is one of the first Pokemon to not evolve with level ups, uh, stone, or trading. He evolves with friendship. The only way for a Crobat to exist is if you've shown a Golbat the sort of love it could have only dreamed of, and this gives it a shockingly high behavior rating. Crobat learned how to love, and it's thanks to you, so it's already your best friend. Crobat cannot exist without the milk of human kindness. <laughs> Except for one route in Alola during raid battles. <laughs> Ten brings us to the... Okay, pets, these guys might not be the first choice you should go for, but with enough elbow grease, you can sculpt them into a great partner. Yanma is the first member of that group, and he's a mixed basket that leans more towards positive than negative. Of course, if you have one of those houses with uh, windows in them, Yanma might be a bad choice, since his wing beat is so fast that a sudden stop can create a sonic boom that can shatter glass. And there are parts of your head that aren't as durable as glass. He's also about four feet long, which means he's as long as Piloswine is tall, so housing him can be difficult. But the ease of care on this guy is insanely good. Dragonflies in the real world are great at catching pest species like mosquitoes. Yeah, I'd go right the fuck back up if I were you, bozo. This is Yanma country. It's not much worth keeping track of Yanma when he's out of the house since he's so fast, so he's pretty self-sufficient in terms of walks, but he has plenty of problems keeping him from breaking into the higher tiers. Corsola may be the biggest glass cannon in terms of pet ownership. It's a rock with a face, and it's nice about it. No big old sour scowl like Geodude, this thing loves life! What little life it gets! Corsola's problems have nothing to do with Corsola. If these two stats were different, Corsola wouldn't be anywhere near these other jabronis. But its housing and ease of care ruin this thing. Do you have any idea how hard it is to grow coral? Coral may be one of the most fragile forms of life on the planet, needing a perfect ecosystem to survive, and gets hit by pollution worse than almost anything else. That means, unless you keep its water impossibly clean, changing it out daily to filter out the impurities, Corsola is going to get really sick. Do you think there's a reason the only other Corsola we know about are the dead ones? Octillery is another Pokemon that I wished was higher up, because he's just a regular octopus. And I love him for it. First off, starting from Remoraid is not gonna prepare you for where this goes. Puberty's a bitch. Now, it shouldn't be a shocker that an octopus based on tanks is a heavy hitter, but it's not just the attacks coming out of his mouth you need to look out for, since his head is just as dangerous. Octopi can also be super smart, and become attached to their owners if they're treated right, so not smacking around Octillery might just be the key to not having a hole punched in your chest. He's getting carried by typing, I'll admit it. Finally is another Pokemon that should be no surprise to see so low, Skarmory. Sometimes, this is really easy. An aggressive bird covered in swords shouldn't need an explanation, but Skarmory's too popular, he might as well get one. Oh, you're lucky you're so handsome. Shock of shocks, Skarmory isn't actually that poorly behaved. 
nothing in the decks leads you to calling it one way or the other, so it's safe to assume that he's a decent pet in that regard. Housing, though? Well, if you take into account that he's made of metal, it's pretty bad. The two things the Dex loves to talk about when it comes to Skarmory is how fast he loves to fly and how it molts its steel feathers. That means that while traveling at over 180 miles per hour, there's a chance Skarmory will just randomly drop a samurai sword onto a crowd of unsuspecting people. Keep him well groomed and maybe you can let him fly like he likes, but if you don't, just make sure to get that funeral suit steamed. Eleven is the home to three of the most iconic Johto Pokémon, and three that people are just gonna be so happy to see solo down. For Alligator seems like the most cut and dry case out of any of these. Feral? Alligator. He was so excited to get to hurting people he left home without all his vowels. At a hulking seven foot tall and a massive 195 pounds. What? Real alligators weigh half a ton. You might be able to lift this guy. For alligator once again proves that typing can make up for a lot when it comes to being a pet. As water typing buoys a lot of negatives like incredible aggression, a voracious appetite, and huge bulk that makes him a pain to keep as a pet. Like I said, Said, not hard to see why he ranks so lowly. He's not quite Charizard, but he's not quite better. Umbreon is next, and from one starter to another, I see you, R.A. Umbreon is the highest rated dark type out of the whole lot. Great. No matter what I say, it's still an evolution. You're gonna get a certain level of cutesy charm no matter what, and housing it is as easy as any other evolution. That said, he's not doing himself any favors. The major problems with him are being nocturnal and safety. Can't really play with him much if you two have completely opposite sleep schedules. But what's worse is that out of self-defense, Umbreon has the ability to sweat. Oh! Oh, poison! I've said this for years, but now I'm sure of it. Johto is just Kanto again. Your dog works up a sweat, suddenly the air reeks of death. It's a fair trade for watching rings light up. Lastly is Wobbuffet. So let's get the big one out of the way. What you exactly would do with a Wobbuffet is a mystery. The closest thing you can compare it to is a punching bag, but you don't buy a dog to practice rope-a-dope on it, so the problem really comes from what exactly does Wobbuffet do? At least why not has legs? All we know about Wobbuffet is that it doesn't like bright lights, so I guess keep it indoors? Honestly, he kinda makes a better home defense system than a pet in that regard. He sees somebody walk in? Destiny Bond. 12 is our biggest class yet, with a crowd of five, including a few of Johto's best and brightest, who just so happen to completely fail at being pets. Typhlosion is first, and normally those exposed flames would be an issue, but a trip to the third dimension seems to have curtailed any worry of that. That retractable flame is about an equal exchange for an apparent secret technique Typhlosion knows where it can rub its fur together to create an explosion. Yeah, dude, it's called explosion. Licky Licky can learn it too. Without the exposed flame, Typhlosion is about as close to a normal type as you can get, and without any mention of a 10,000 degree hot sack, it makes him... Fine. Getting a Typhlosion over a normal type is like getting a dog who knows how to make a Molotov cocktail. He might not do it, but just get a pug for God's sake. Jumpluff is absolutely bizarre. This thing shouldn't be as low as it is. It's just a ball that jumps, right? Well, for the most part, yeah, it's just that. But thanks to Scarlet and Violet, this thing's credit took a humongous hit. Somehow, the less offensive one is Violet, who talks about how breathing in near a jump bluff is likely to have you breathing in spores that cause horrible coughing and itches. Yeah, breathing? You might want to put that on the hold when jump bluffs around. That makes its yearly floats around the world on the spring breeze seem sinister when you know the side effects. But it's Scarlet that really puts this thing so far down. Those travels around the world it does to spread its spores? They have to end eventually, and when the trip ends, they do too. A jump bluff who loses all of its spores dies, and given how this Pokemon leaves home when the breeze rolls in, your jump bluff is just gonna vanish one day, and the only solace you get is that one day, 
It'll die. I, I can't live with that. Do you know how sad it will be when Jump Luff just vanishes one day and then a few days later you hear a knocking on the door? It's a baby hop hip that has the exact same face that your Jump Luff has and it jumps up into your arms like it's known you its entire life just because you treated Jump Luff so good. I can't, I'm not emotionally ready for Jump Luff. If Octillery and Crobat were hard for me to rate lowly, rating what was once my absolute favorite is heartbreak. But if Pinsir got this low, Heracross has got to be here too. So, Heracross is a parallel to Pinsir in a lot of ways. Where one is a stag beetle, Heracross is a Hercules beetle, and swaps out a pair of mandibles for a great big horn. That horn is cause for alarm, since he loves tossing things with it. So while he can keep attackers at bay, he's also likely to send a log flying through your roof cause he wanted to see if he could throw it. Ease of care though is a huge boon to him, since he loves nectar and honey. You know exactly what to buy, and it's not hard to find it occurring naturally. Trees have nectar and honey coming out the wazoo, and some Pokemon like Bulbasaur have it coming out their wazoos. Heracross isn't bad, but you need to know exactly what you're doing. Now if there was a Jax preference category, Heracross would be number one no problems, but I can't do that. Dawnfan is next, and a design like this is one that's built to last. As long as people exist, we'll be liking Dawnfan. Just like with Jumpluff, Paldea helped characterize Dawnfan a little better, but instead of a ragweed spreading ticking death clock, Paldea leaves it as Dawnfan is pretty calm. When it isn't calm though, which it seems to be a lot, it will curl up into a ball and barrel headlong into whatever's causing it trouble. Nearly 300 pounds of Elephun charging at you doesn't sound like something you would want to see, but at the very least, you can rest assured knowing Dawnfan will be fine since it's very hard to superficially damage. Yeah, he treated the I-95 like a bowling alley and took out a couple dozen cars, but he doesn't need a bath, and he wouldn't want one either, ground types hate that. Again, specialized care is a must. Finally is Lugia, who is not a water type. Lugia is not a water type. Lives under the water, parallel to a fire type, psychic. Of course it is! They aren't gonna make one box legendary super effective against the other. Dear Game Freak, die bitch. Love Groudon. Co-signed by Solgaleo! Just like with a Pokemon like Jumpluff or Venomoth, its real destructive potential isn't because it's mean, but because it has to move. A Lugia on the move has the ability to, at least, destroy a house, and if he's really getting up and going, he can cause a 40 day long storm. What the hell is gonna be left after 40 days of storms? Well, water. Which it isn't! Lugia's ease of care comes from how it just doesn't really need your help. It's a giant whale monster that lives at the bottom of the ocean. What are you gonna do? And, if I may, I'd like to propose that Lugia is some sort of chaos sigil that does mental damage to anybody who looks at him for too long. It's happened twice now. All I'm saying is that calling the Ultra Beasts Lovecraftian is a bit disingenuous when this guy's been driving writers insane for over 20 years. The three Pokemon saddled with the unlucky number 13 start out with your friend and mine, Dunsparce. Everybody's favorite lump of yellow clay is our bridge towards... Uh, yeah, that's... Fine, I guess, since he's very standard in a lot of ways. He thanks God every day he was born a normal type as it helps out his rather standard stats all around. He's easy to care for, well behaved, and not much of a danger if you don't count the drill, but what's he gonna menace with that, wine corks? Housing, though, is his Achilles heel, since whenever he spots someone he doesn't recognize, his immediate reflex is to burrow underground. He's gonna dig his way from the living room to the basement a lot is what I'm trying to say. He's not a bad choice, but going to the dog park might be a bit boring with him being underground all the time. And while I'm at it, I just want to hop up on my handy dandy soapbox and say if you can't appreciate the Dunsparce, I don't think Pokemon's for you. He is wonderful and the manifestation of malicious compliance. Oh, you want more Dunsparce? 
Here you go, have a double, no triple. Following him is another Pokemon who kisses the ground Scarlet and Violet walks on, Girafferig. Girafferig is a Pokemon kinda defined by its solitary gimmick. Finding a dex entry about anything other than its butt head and the brain inside that head is impossible. It's always talking about how it stays up while Girafferig sleeps, or how it might bite someone who tries to approach him from the rear. But other than that, it doesn't mention much else. What we do get is that it's a grazer, eating grass and tree shoots, which means that's ease of care taken care of, and its relatively small size means you're not in danger of ruining your lawn. It's nice to see a psychic type that doesn't see you thinking and take it as an insult. Finally is Ursaring, who is trying as hard as possible to prove that being a normal type means you don't have to try that hard. Now, try to believe me, he is not poorly behaved. Yeah, that's right, pet him, tug his fur, pat his belly, steal his baby, he'll be cool. It never talks about how violent it is or an incident where it bit a kid's head off. No, instead it talks about how Ursaring is a very hungry bear who likes to eat honey and berries. It doesn't matter if it goes unsaid, it's a bear. He's still gonna be dangerous. He's just not being a dickhead for no reason. 14 houses just one Pokemon, Noctowl. Noctowl's normal flying type means he's in stiff competition with heavy hitters like Pidgeot. And while he's not bad by any stretch, he's got a few issues that keep him from being a really good pet. One problem it doesn't have, surprisingly, is housing. That's because even though it's nocturnal, like a lot of other Pokemon, its feathery down means that it flies in almost total silence. It's a hunter, which means you don't have to worry about food, and also incredibly expressive, with it easy to read its mood based on its head orientation. If it's right side up, you're doing something right. If it's upside down, flee town. Poor Knocked Owl, though. What a massive variety of types it could have been, only to have them all stolen out from under him. Oh, he's a smart bird, so psychic flying. Mmm. Oh, well, he hunts at night, so dark flying. Mmm. Ghost flying? Mm -hmm. Oh man, I can't keep up. You're telling me 15 comes after 14? We're into the good pets now. These guys are rock solid and only have room to grow from here. And who better to usher in this era of better pets than every Johto player's favorite friend, Miltank. Check under your seats, barf bags were provided. While it's downright pleasant in almost every way, ease of care and housing tank this Pokemon's performance because it's a cow. Do you ever wonder why casual cow ownership never really caught on? It's because taking care of a cow is hard work. So much food and land goes into raising a healthy cow that you're dedicating loads of time, energy, and money into meeting its needs. That's on top of the five gallons of milk it produces every day, meaning you're a milkman now, whether you want to be or not. Sudden career pivots aside, it's really good in all other aspects. It's a happy, plump little cow that loves rolling around and drinking milk. Does it curl up into a ball and suck on its own teat, or does it spray the milk directly up into its mouth? By owning a milk tank, you can find the answers to one of life's greatest mysteries. Stantler is next, and, well, well, sometimes you get one who's just straight down the middle. Is there anything interesting about Stantler? No. Is there anything wrong with Stantler? No. Are we staying here any longer? No. Mantine is next and has quite a bit to talk about. The Wind Riding Manta Ray is an incredibly friendly Pokemon, with it becoming a popular pastime in Alola to swim and surf alongside them. It's mellow enough to let Remoraid swim alongside it, hunts on its own, and doesn't seem to have a mean bone in its body. Problem is, he has too many nice bones. Mantine is big. Really, really big. A seven foot wingspan means that there's no way to keep this thing comfortable, and it's going to need to stay in the ocean. Not even an Olympic sized swimming pool could keep this guy happy. You need a pool the size of a football field to make him comfortable. This is another case where, under very specific circumstances, Mantine is a perfect pet. But outside of its niche, it's completely unrealistic. 16 is the home to the final legends of Johto, both the bird and beast and this 
Weird, just a weird lumpy fish. Why does Lantern look like that? I know it's not part of the grating, but Lantern's always looked real weird to me. I don't know why. Anyway, electricity and water go together, right? Obviously, this is a type combination so bad it ought to be a deduction on its own, but believe it or not, it doesn't produce the sort of electricity we all associate with electric types. Lantern's lights are all bioluminescent, created by bacteria that lives in it. That means that playtime with Lantern won't turn into a massacre. That must mean it's safe, right? Wrong. Flashbang. Lantern's main method of incapacitating enemies involves flashing its lure brightly enough to blind its prey, so brightly it can be seen from the surface over three miles down. The idea of generating lights that can be seen over three miles away in water is horrifying, because the thing about those dark depths... It's dark! Light travels so poorly through water that to generate intense enough light to be seen that far away would produce so much energy and heat it would just vaporize anything in its vicinity. So how the heck is that safety stat so high if it can give you third degree burns with its headlights? Well, I think it's safe to assume that it's not busting this out all the time. Living so far down in the ocean is what facilitates needing such a strong light. Above the water, it's gonna require a lot less to stun an opponent, so it will pull back and be a lot more reasonable. So even though it's a big number and awfully spooky to the average reader, it's not as bad as it first seems. <laughs> it's not like his body is made of electricity. That'd be stupid. Polytoad proudly presents a pristine power-up for Poliwhirl. Though procuring the part for its progression may prove pestering, the potent potential of Politoed is plain to peep. Prohibiting punches may appear pedantic, but passing on the possibility for pugilistic powers provides prodigious precipitation. Perchance you presumed that prevents problems, but peaking its personal practices provides proof of putrid performances. Poliwhirl and Poliwag are its protégés, and as principal pioneer of their preparation, its piercing peels produce phobic performances. Politoed may please pros pursuing prestigious prizes, but Politoed's pleasant personality proves phony with puny progeny. Next up is Suicune, and it's been so long you may have forgotten, but he's actually in a trio. Yeah, there's like two more of them. One of them wants to be Ash's dad, I guess. Now, what's holding him back is that nothing holds him back. Putting this thing on a leash is just a way to lose a leash. He won't stay still no matter what, but for once, he actually has somewhere to be. Suicune is a majestic beast who has the magical power to purify water. Which means you own a dog who's making a difference. He's also not the easiest to care for since he's not doing this for his health or, you know, maybe he is. The ease of care is because you need to hold yourself to a higher standard of living or else Suicune is gonna start getting pissed off. No more littering, gotta sort your bottles and cans, drive a fuel-efficient car. I bet Suicune would love a break, but as long as that gas-guzzling rev of room is in the driveway, I guess he won't get one. Finally is ho -Oh. and the first thing you're gonna need to get over with ho -Oh is the moral issues of keeping a beautiful wish-granting phoenix in your garage. But you're not even gonna get your hands on it if you're not worthy. Ho-Oh only appears to the pure of heart, so if you manage to get so far as to plan out what color to paint his room, he already respects you. Ho-Oh actually lacks a lot of the downsides that placed Lugia noticeably lower, like no disasters in his wake, no issues with housing. Sure, he's still a 12-foot-tall, 400-pound bird, but he's not making this any harder than it has to be. The two all the way up in 17 start with the second in Johto's statue trio, Zatu. What a pretty statue, your friends will say when they walk into your house. Thanks, he has anxiety. Zatu's in a similar boat to his statuesque brothers in Wabafet and Sudowudo, since he's not really up to much. As a psychic type, he has a bit more potential thanks to his ability to move things with his mind, but there's a double-edged sword with Zatu. Sure, his immobility means he's at no risk of hurting anybody, 
Why he's standing there, though, is the big issue. Zatu has two eyes. You know, like Onyx. One eye watches the future while the other observes the past. The most generous interpretation is that he's immobile because he knows the future will come to pass no matter what, and there's nothing he can do to change it. Alright, my bird has already sunk all the way into nihilism, and you're telling me it gets worse? Yes, in the Omega Ruby entry, it discusses how Zatu will stand motionless out of fear of a horrible future yet to pass. Keeping Zatu around will just be a massive stress spot where looking at him reminds you, oh yeah, I'm gonna die one day. If you can accept your own mortality, sure, get yourself a totem bird. Ampharos is next, and the world's most awkward sheep is pretty great as a pet. First off, if anybody is watching this in a lighthouse, sit down, because you're about to meet your new best friend. Sheep are kind and friendly animals, and as dubious as its species is, I'm inclined to say it would be just as lovable as a sheep with its wool. Not to mention it's got long, dormant dragon blood that awakens when it mega evolves. But remember, if I see you mega evolving a Pokemon, I'm gonna have to assume you're doing some other heinous shit. 18 is the final group with five Mons, and we start with Apom. People love pets with personality. Dog sneezes once, now it's the sneezing dog. Same with the murder dog. Apom is like that, except there's a great chance you're gonna hate his personality. Apom is a monkey, and while real monkeys can be like a sugar-high baby with the ability to climb anything, Apom seems to be just a little more tempered. Nothing describes it as a pest or annoying. In fact, the worst you can levy against him is that He's a klutz. Given how much he does with his tail, Apom's own hands have grown clumsy, and he has difficulty holding stuff. Keely, not being a dark type means it's a lot more likely Apom will know when he's taken a joke too far, and will give you back whatever it swipes after it's satisfied. Murkrow and Sneasel, meanwhile, are in the backyard burning your driver's license. Sudowoodo is next, and one of the instances of behavior being so low, not because it's a poorly behaved Pokemon, no see, it doesn't do enough for it to be poorly behaved. Pseudowoodo is obsessed with acting like a tree. It is pseudo-wood, after all. That means you're buying a literal statue most of the time. Get it wet and things might get hectic, but at least unlike Zatu, whose stoic nature is out of pure cosmic dread, Pseudowoodo at least enjoys doing it. And in that context, he's actually a pretty great pet. You aren't gonna catch a pseudo wudo without knowing what you're getting yourself into. So once you have one, you can join the pseudo wudo fan club and subscribe to their magazine, send in photos of pseudo wudo, and get them graded and learn all there is to know about the rock who wants to be a tree. Next is Quagsire. He's just a big, dumb idiot. Plus, he can introduce you to Wooper. Drink the bug milk! You're making him sad! He's making so much of it! Drink the bug milk or he's gonna cry! Yeah, that's shuckle for ya. Needing to get him all the berries he needs to ferment all that bug juice is gonna be quite the pricey endeavor, unless you knuckle down and make your own trees. Other than that, and a harsh typing score, Shuckle's kind of wonderful. He's just a little worm living in a rock, and while it's gonna be awkward when your guests find out where this delicious punch came from, the Pokedex doesn't treat Shuckle's drink-making process like the weird thing it absolutely is. It comes down to taste, really, as it does with a lot of bug types, but Shuckle is easily the best one to come out of Johto. Last up for 18 is Delibird, and... You can own Santa Claus! Sure, you've got to keep your house at sub-zero temperatures, but he's a kind soul! It's impossible to hate a Pokémon who doesn't want to do anything but be nice and spread goodwill. It's not his fault that sometimes there are bombs in his presence. Deli birds throughout history are known to help the lost and hungry by bringing them food. They're great with kids, and if that housing problem gets too bad, you can always consider picking up an Alolan Deli Bird, since they're far more resilient to the heat than others. Hypothermia, though, is just a small price to pay for spreading joy like Deli Bird does. The final stop before the best of the best is 19, and once again, an evolution managed to sneak in. And this time, people haven't been weird about it. 
As weird about it, Espeon is the sun to Umbreon's moon, which means where Umbreon fails, Espeon succeeds. Umbreon's poisonous sweat is replaced with very sensitive hairs on the tip of Espeon's forked tail, and nobody's ever slipped sensitive hair into tea to kill their rich husband. If you take away the psychic powers, Espeon's kinda just a normal cat. It likes bathing in the sun, gets sad when it's cold, and it's got a jewel. If you haven't found your cat's emerald yet, you're just a bad pet owner. Espeon is also another Pokemon where it will only exist if it loves its trainer. And unlike Umbreon, it developed its powers further because it wanted to keep its trainer safe. Not because glowing sounded cool. Finally is Ledian, the second half of Johto's poor, underwhelming bug duo. Ledian is a shocking upset to see make this far. I thought it'd be written off real early by some deck sentry talking about a time it robbed a gas station, but instead it paints a very cute picture. During the day, it's very sleepy and enjoys curling up in the grass to rest and eat berries. At night, it seems to draw a strange power from the stars themselves and uses that to fuel its fighting efforts. Except as we learn, it's not especially dangerous in that regard. Just one of his fists is barely enough to do anything. That's why he needs four of them. You're not in any danger around Ledian. Even the dust it spreads while looking up at the stars is treated as a symbol of good luck. Ledian is really on the cusp of breaking into the 20s, which is where we're moving next, and how's our absolute top tier Poke Pets. These are the gold standards that, if you can get, you absolutely should. 20 is prime real estate, and it belongs solely to the king, Slow King. That's right, when an evil little creature isn't sitting on his head and teaching him slurs, Slowking can actually be pretty cool. Now, he is still getting gallons upon gallons of poison dumped into his brain, but unlike Umbreon and Gligar, he rises above it and only uses it as a brain booster. Slowking is an extremely intelligent Pokémon, able to match wits with other psychic types like Oranguru, and act as a sage for people in need of advice. While his large size might make him a bit of a tight squeeze, his greatest asset is his temperament. Slowking is easygoing and laid back, while being more alert than Slowpoke. That does mean he's more likely to remember when you forget to buy him those pants you promised, but just don't forget, dummy. 21 is our introduction to the first actual dog in this generation, Smeargle. Don't let those overdeveloped hind legs fool you, this guy's a pup and a creative one. Smeargle's main feature is its tail and the paint-like fluids it secretes that it uses for drawing. This is the first time secrete and fluids are used to describe a Pokémon that doesn't end in a fatality. Smeargle is a kind and docile Pokémon with not much of a care in the world except how to express itself. Behavior-wise, that can often create problems, since it will wander around town and mark the buildings with graffiti, but if you can make sure he varies up his designs, they might not catch him. But even then, the cost of canvases is offset by the greatest part of owning a Smeargle. He's a money-making machine. Collectors go gaga for Smeargle art, so set your little buddy off on the one thing he loves more than anything, and by the end of the day, you've paid off your student debt. The trans icon themselves, Azumarill, is next, and... There's not much that can really sell Azumarill more than it does to sell itself. It's a big, beautiful bundle of blue hugs. It's like Stantler, but in reverse, where why it's so amazing is so plain to see that you don't really need help understanding. Do you want me to talk about how it loves riverbeds? Do you want to hear about its excellent hearing? How it became fairy type? Or do you just want to look at its face? Our final stop on the road to the top 5 best and worst is 22, and it's a grass-type extravaganza! First up is the Guardian of Time, Celebi. At least they used to be. Nowadays they're kind of the middle-level manager of time. Thanks a lot, Dialga. Celebi is a beacon of sorts, with its arrival heralding a positive and prosperous future. Life just improves with a Celebi around. Not just your own, but the life around you. 
Celebi's ability to revive plant life and bolster the environment means that it can generate positive feelings all around. An entire city would see its mood improve thanks to Celebi. The only problem is that its nature leads it to leave a lot to travel through time. Where and when it ends up makes it hard to determine when you're gonna get to see it again, but it's also said to leave eggs from the future that it finds. Now, this could be good, but at the same time, you have to think about what Zatu's been saying, cause the future sounds kinda scary. Finally is the highest rated starter ever, Meganium. You'd think that housing what amounts to a dinosaur would be tough, but at 5'11", it's not that tight a squeeze. Besides, it'll be spending most of its time basking in the sun. It has a power similar to Celebi, where it can revive dead plants, and has a major bonus over other grass starters. Unlike Venusaur's poison typing, Monograss Meganium doesn't give off poison, but a sweet scent, and calms down aggressive people and Pokémon the same. Meganium's positive influence means it doesn't just help itself, but other Pokémon that can't quite keep their emotions under control. Though, it might not be enough to wrangle the bottom five, which leads us into the top five! <laughs> Except, uh, Johto's funny, cause they went and gave an evolution to the last champ, Porygon. Porygon 2 is pretty much a better Porygon. Same digital home, ease of care, safety… heck, the one problem with Porygon was literally smoothed out. So, naturally, he's still the best, so… TOP 6 BEST Poke Pets! No, uh, no, not that either. Blissey. Yeah, Chansey got an evolution too, and it's just more Chansey. Top 7 best, the winner gets the bronze medal. But before we can even think about the lofty heights of third place, we've got to deal with our fifth worst Poke Pet. With a sour mug like that, it's not a surprise Quillfish is not too keen on the pet life, and he's sure to let you know. Quillfish are known to puff up at the sight of danger and launch their spines at their attackers. Its poor swimming skills give it a complex like Piloswine, where anything it can see is a potential threat, so it's incredibly violent. But a poison type is only as dangerous as the poison he creates, and it just so happens that Quillfishes is among the worst of them all. Simply fainting doesn't sound that bad, but where are you gonna be tangling with a Quillfish? The water, and the doggy paddle gets a lot harder to perform when you can't move. <laughs> Just wait until we get to Hisui where he can't stop puffing up. As for the fifth best Poke Pet... Isn't it weird that this was Togepi's final evolution for a few regions? Like, this thing is begging to evolve. This is not the neck of a confident final evolution. Now, no necks, that's the future. Togetic comes from the absolutely blessed Togepi line and is the highest rated friendship Pokemon. That means you've proven yourself and are only just now reaping the benefits. When it's around kind-hearted people, it will shower them with happiness, or as one dex entry insists on calling it, joy dust. Do not inhale the joy dust. The only con you can really find with Togetic is that if you start acting like a bad person or have a lot of jerk friends, it makes Togetic sad. It doesn't make it sick or make it die, you'll just disappoint it. This is a Pokemon who's so kind you might start getting imposter syndrome. Like, surely I don't deserve this. Guess what, dummy, you do. Number four for the worst is... You had one shot, ghost types, and the best you could muster was going from the second worst to the fourth worst. Hey, next list, you might actually escape the bottom five. As long as one of you doesn't start wanting to kill children. Mistrevious's crimes extend far past only being available in Kanto. As with nothing but a head and a necklace, it can do major damage. The deck entries start gently, saying it loves to annoy and spook people by biting their hair and screaming in their face when they sleep. That's the nice stuff it does, by the way. By Alola, though, they started to realize 
Why play it so subtly? Just start draining people of their life force, lure them in with the sounds of crying children. It flat out admits that its entire reason for living is just to scare people. Listen, ghost types, stop being so bad and I'll start being nicer. Speaking of nicer is number four best. Sunflora's never been on a list that either wasn't worst fully evolved Pokemon or best Pokemon themed after the sun. In all fairness, Sunflora is an extremely safe pick. Baby's first Pokemon isn't a bad title for Sunflora as a pet. It's not physically or specially intimidating. It's got no secondary typing that drags down a fantastic grass typing. It doesn't have much negative in its dex entries. Truly, Sunflora managed to get this far not because it's especially standout like a Togetic or the later picks. It makes it this far because it's very plain and. It's not the worst thing when your dog can't bend space and time. Number three worst could stand to learn a lesson from that. Oh man, what a fall off for pseudo legendaries. Last gen, Dragonite, friend shaped, sailors, good, Tyranitar, evil, nasty, green. Who would be green? Dragonite, sweetie, I know you're just trying to make him feel better. Oh man, does Tyranitar not want to be a pet? Featuring nicknames like a mobile disaster and mountain mover, his destructive potential can't be understated. Tyranitar can rearrange entire mountain ranges during its very frequent temper tantrums and can be felt coming from a mile away. It's a brand of aggression unmatched by most any Pokemon, and its impenetrable armor means that not only is it impossible to take down, it knows it. Tyranitar, on top of all of this, is an incredibly headstrong Pokemon, thanks to its bulk and will throw that weight around. The only people it spares are people too weak to put up a fight. Eh, big talk coming from Mr. Four Times Weak to Fighting. It also might not have the easiest time against our number three best Poke Pet. Yep, the new final evolution for a line that bottomed out at Steelix levels of you're so lucky you have a cute face, Blossom takes the Oddish line all the way to a third place finish. Uh, what was holding it back was the, uh, uh, the poison. Blossom lives for one thing and one thing only, dancing. When the sun emerges, it will dance happily, improving moods and releasing wonderful scents. If the sun isn't out, surprise, it has a dance to call forth the sun. Nothing will stop this thing from dancing, and with all the benefits that it brings, far be it from me to stop it. For the number two worst Poke Pet, seeing him away from number one might be a shock, but... Yep, the elephant finally entered the room. So Magcargo hangs over the Johto pet scene like an anvil, cause it seems like a conversation isn't even necessary. Magcargo is said to clock in at over 18,000 degrees and boils water on contact with its skin. Yeah, I think it also ignites the atmosphere, but sure, let's talk about the water. Now, the Pokedex can exaggerate on occasion, especially in regard to what these things can do to Indian elephants. So can we really trust 18,000 degrees? How are you even gonna get an accurate measurement on something like that? If you go based on the real world equivalent to Mag Cargo, magma, you're looking at nearly a ninth of that measurement at only 2,000 degrees. That's much more reasonable and just as fatal. Now, 2,000 degrees is how hot Mag Cargo's body is, but that doesn't automatically mean it's gonna be 2,000 degrees everywhere it goes. People have been able to get around 5 feet away from an active lava flow in little more than a t-shirt and cargo shorts and feel like they're near a fireplace. Mag Cargo is far less fatal than you'd first assume by reading its hyperbolic dex entry. But it's still magma. It's still hot enough to ignite wood by getting too close to it, evaporate water, burn you. What keeps Mag Cargo out of the worst of the worst is a combination of how it's not as dangerous as it seems, but it's also not badly behaved. Their shells are described as brittle and it's afraid of the rain, so it sounds kind of like a scaredy cat to me. Even with an okay personality, Mag Cargo still earns its low spot. As for the top spot, we got a tie. 
The last two Pokemon are so fantastic and lovable, they each got a perfect score. Truthfully, they both get first place, so take their placement with a grain of salt. We might as well be going alphabetically. We're going alphabetically. Number two best Poke Pet goes to... Where is he? Majestic, urbane, awe-inspiring. Furret! There have been Pokémon like Azumarill where their amazing aspects are kind of hard to put into words. With Furret, I find it near impossible. He wants to live in your couch cushions and chase Rattatas. How could you hate him? Imagine using him as a neck pillow when you sleep. Imagine how good he is at giving hugs. Imagine picking anybody other than Furret. Oh right, I did, sorry. The come down to the absolute worst Poké Pet in Johto, though, is like a plane crashing. Oh, big shock, the Hellhound isn't nice. Houndoom is a hauntingly evil Pokemon. Mix two types that underperform on their own and put it on a pooch with the personality of a hot brand. The conversation should begin and end at its horrible attitude and aggressive nature, but what Houndoom exceeds at is being an asshole in such unique ways. First up is its fire, which is created by igniting toxins! God! Damn it! This unique way of making fire means that the fire also smells awful. So while you're burning to death, everybody around you is gonna have to hold their nose. Let's say the impossible happens and you survive a Houndoom attack. Well, the horror show's only just begun, as the toxins in Houndoom's fire serve a secondary purpose. Once you're burned with a Houndoom's flame, the pain never ends. However long you choose to make the rest of your life is going to be spent feeling like you're on fire. There's a reason older cultures thought he was the Grim Reaper. No, turns out he's just working on commission for him. Houndoom is a monster of a Pokemon. If you own one, no one is gonna believe you're not a serial killer. And after a whole list of calling Pokemon dogs, who'd have thought that the whole thing would be bookended by two dogs? I didn't believe it at first. I really didn't. This big old mutt looks like the furthest thing from a good pet. He looks like the furthest thing from anything else in the top five. But lo and behold, it's actually the best of the best. So what is it about Granbull that makes him such a perfect pet? Well, first off, he's a fairy. Sure, let's go with that. The first thing you have to learn about Granbull is how much its looks deceive you. What looks like the world's toughest guard dog is little more than an overly pampered puppy who's more timid than anything. He hates fighting and causing trouble and just wants to be a good boy. If Mastiffs can be good dogs, then so can Granbull. He'll fight if he absolutely has to, but if it can be avoided, he'll just run away. That actually makes him kind of unpopular with people who want him to be a guard dog or a nasty pit bull that can sick on people, but he's just not that kind of dog. The Pokedex calls him totally incompetent as a guard dog, which... Harsh, but at least you're pointing people in the right direction. So you're totally safe around it, it's as easy to house as a dog, has the perfect typing, easy to take care of, and best of all is a total scaredy sweetheart. Granbull just needs a little love and you've got the perfect pet. So what's the takeaway from all this? It seems like this should all be cut and dry, but then you see an example like this. A short all about how kind Slugma is, and notice how the girl isn't melting. Later, her grandma is knitting with Ariados, and that guy was way down on the list. Meanwhile, this Togekiss is more than happy to see the entire human race extincted. What I'm trying to say is that as much as you want to break it down into numbers, a Pokemon at the end of the day is such a fantastical work of fiction that you really can't. There's probably a loving and caring Houndoom out there, or a nasty and rotten Furret. Ultimately, I don't think there's any point at trying to rank them like this. Psych. Digimon won again, baby! Pop the champagne! <laughs> we never need to check our watches again! It's always Agumon o'clock! We're watching the Digimon movie tonight, boys! Angela and Akonda been included! Another win for the good guys! Remember, children, sometimes the worst hells are of our own creation. Sephora, Igglybuff, 
Piloswine Slugma, Crowbat Politoed, Noctowl Houndour, Heracross Nat 2, Tyrogue Ariados, Lugia Steelix, Fampy Ampharos! I bet you didn't even know there was a Johto Poke Rap. Cause it sucks. It's not nearly as good or iconic as the original. Like, these singers are being beaten to death by this rhythm. As am I, I'm not trying to say that I'm any better, I'm just trying to say Pseudo Budo Corsola, Teddy Ursa Sneasel, Foratris Mantine, Pichu Larvatar, Hoot Hoot Milk Tank Totodile Glygar, Lantern Skarmory, Spinarat Tyranitar! I even had to get a new version of the song made just so I didn't get killed by copyright. Who, I will credit, Egophobia created this song, and they are absolutely fantastic. A joy to work with. They turned absolute dog piss into lemonade. Chikorita Dunsparce, Apom Pupitar, Porygon 2, Cyndaquil, Elekid, Raikou, Wabafet Typhlosion, Granbull, Pokemon, Stantler, Espeon, Lediba, Togepi. There's also singing in between the Pokemon, which makes this so much harder to fill. So let's nourish the brain a bit. This is the opening to The Great Gatsby. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all those people in the world haven't had the advantages that you've had. Uh, a mind-blowing piece of literature from uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the author we were all forced to read in middle school and never really got the message of. There was a 2013 movie by Bad Quillfish, Ho, Oh, Azumarill, Crocona, Snubble, Ursa Ring, Yanma, Smoochum, Slow King, Blissey, Caesar, Donphan, Houndoom, Octillery, Whooper, Mary, Hitmontop, Meryl, Umbreon, Bailey! So what's your guys' favorite Pokemon? Mine used to be Heracross, but uh, I sort of warmed up. Skurumkern, Ledian, Girafferig, Murkrow, Remoraid, Jumpluff, Quilava, Smeargle, Swine of Magcargo, Furrit, Belossum, Flaffy, Entei, Meganium, Magby, Zatum, Bastridius, Togetic, Chuckle, Quagsire, Pineco, Chinchow, Veraligator, Hopip, Kingdra, Unown, Cleffa, Suicune, Delibird, Sentry, Skip Bloom! Uh, now I think it might be Electivire. <laughs> 